Like I said, there's, um, on our website, there's more information about how, how you come alongside uh, this organization, but also how we'll be hosting this uh, night together as a family uh, or as a church. And um, speaking of that, there are multiple ways. Um, they, we see you San Diego has hosts already in place for that night. And so really what we've signed up for is, is just to bring the meal but that we aren't limited to just bringing the meal. Um, if you would like to serve that night um, or any other night, you're welcome uh, to connect with C We See You San Diego. They are in Linda Vista, um, basically at the end of Friars Road, um, past uh, the Fashion Valley Mall at a church there. Um, so again, we'd love for you to, to partner with us in hosting this event. Well, we're gonna continue our series called Jesus for Everyone. We're gonna be in Luke chapter 10. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version, from the ESV, and I'm starting at verse 17. A little bit of a context for you. Um, right before this, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus has just sent out 72 disciples. Some of your translations may say 70. Um, I won't go into all the detail as why some translations say 72, some say 70. There are some original manuscript kind of issues that are going on there, the Septuagint, Hebrew translations versus Greek translations. Uh, you can dive into that this week if you would like. Um, just know that the translation I'm reading says 72. Um, Jesus has just sent out 72 disciples, and they come back rejoicing because of the ministry that they've seen taking place, because of the ways that they have been able to participate in the kingdom mission of Jesus. As they come back, we're picking it up at verse 17, and we're actually going to read through the end of the chapter. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread upon serpents and scorpions and all, all, over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. In that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank you, Father. Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then turning to the disciples, he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. And behold, the lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, the religious uh, expert, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed him, leaving him for half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. 
But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which shall not be taken away from her. Let's, for a moment, in our own minds, recall the most joy-filled moments of our lives. Like, think for a second, pause, ponder, a moment in your life that just brought absolute, exuberant, overflowing joy. Something that just, just, just stirs happiness, joy, excitement, delight within you. One of the, or the last video uh, that I have of my younger brother is uh, his girlfriend filmed him right when the Dodgers won the World Series. Filled with excitement, pacing around the house, just like, I, I couldn't play the video for you because of the words that are in the video. So much joy. And then at one point in the video, he begins to cry. <laughs> Just tears of absolute excitement. And you hear his girlfriend in the video going, are you crying? <laughs> and he says, they won! They won. Moments in our lives overflowing with joy. I have the privilege of officiating weddings and I know that you could picture this probably, this, these own scenes in your own mind right now, that that moment when the bride begins to walk down the aisle and us, as we're there in attendance, look at her face, but then we also look back and look at the face of the groom. And just the look of joy. It's like nothing else matters in that moment the delight that's on their faces. Jesus sends the 72 out. They come back. It says they come back rejoicing. They come back thrilled because of what has taken place. And Jesus says to them, don't rejoice. Get the exact words. Don't, don't rejoice because of, I've given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions, that the, the spirits are, are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And this moment right now causes an overwhelming joy in Jesus. There is no other description in all of the gospel accounts of Jesus being described this way. No other place in the gospel accounts do we get this description of Jesus. It says, in that same hour, he rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. Jesus is absolutely giddy. He's overflowing with delight. Listen, I'll bring, you'll see the words up on, on, on there. This is from the New Living Translation. He was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he said, Oh, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and revealing them to this way. Yes, Father, it pleased you to do it this way. This passage is jam-packed with joy. The disciples come back, the 72 go back, they come back rejoicing. Jesus tells them, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And then the description like no other of him overflowing with joy is written. And then he lets us know, he gives us insight that the Father is pleased that this is taking place. It's, it's, a, it's a passage just filled 
with excitement. Everyone is ecstatic. It's like Saturday mornings in our house when I walk through the front door with a pink box and the boys run around screaming, Donuts! (laughs) There is so much excitement. Have you ever sat with someone who has such a contagious laugh? Maybe something not even funny takes place, but they begin to laugh. (laughs) They're just overwhelmed (laughs) with laughter, and it just spreads like wildfire through the room. Like, that's the kind of moment that we're, we're seeing here, is that Jesus is filled with delight. Why is he filled with such delight? Well, he goes a little bit further. You'll see that the next here verse in verse 24, he says, he t- turns to the disciples and he says, I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Jesus tells us why he is bursting out with absolute laughter and joy and happiness. It's because of this, the childlike the seemingly insignificant, the ones that are the lowly and looked down upon, they are the ones that are understanding and embracing the news of God's kingdom. Jesus is filled with giddiness at unexpected disciples. People that you would not have guessed that are following him, are following him, and it floods him with happiness. That's the whole idea here. It isn't the wise, it isn't the learned, it isn't the clever, it isn't the elite, it isn't the kings, it isn't the prophets, it isn't the religious leaders, it isn't the Levites, it isn't the priests. It's this crew of 72. Jesus is flooded. It's you. It's you. It's you. Listen to the words of N.T. Wright. Jesus celebrates what he realizes as God's strange purpose. If you needed to have privilege, learning, and intelligence in order to enter the kingdom of God, it would simply be another elite organization run run for the benefit of the top people. At every stage, the gospel overturns this idea. Jesus sees that the intimate knowledge which he has of the Father is not shared by Israel's rulers, leaders, and self-appointed teachers, but he can and does share it with his followers, the diverse and motley group he has chosen as his associates. Jesus is coach over the bad news bears, and it can't, he cannot be happier about it. This, this is the crew. This is the crew. These are the ones whose names are written in heaven. And the lesson in Luke 10 is that the kingdom of God is going to be filled with unexpected disciples. And Jesus literally cannot be happier about it. And I think appropriate to stop and to tell you, Jesus is thrilled that you are here. I don't know, maybe you've had relationships in your life. Think about a relationship with, the, with a boss or a coworker or even a friend or, or a neighbor or, or a family member, and you're just not quite sure how they feel about you. Jesus just absolutely opens the door for us to see how he feels about us. He is flooded with joy that you're one of his disciples. He is absolutely giddy 
that you're one of his followers. The amount of joy that exists within Jesus' heart for you. It's absolutely overwhelming to think about. I mean, there's just like a description like no other in all of the gospel accounts because unexpected disciples. He looks at us, the ragtag group of disciples, and he beams with elation. It's you. Your name is written in heaven. And by the way, I think that this description of Jesus' joy teaches us to be people that are thrilled when all matter of people walk through these doors. We look at, at Jesus' joy over the lowly and look down upon, and, and it is meant to be a formative moment for us that we are also to be a people that rejoice and celebrate over those whom Jesus has called to himself. So that we are to be a community that rejoice and celebrate and delight over who God is forming here within our own community. Luke 10 opens up with 72 disciples sent out to participate in the kingdom mission of Jesus. This is a crew of people that are sent out to do what Jesus is doing. Unexpected people are part of this group. It isn't some social elite group. It's a ragtag group, and they're full-on participants in the kingdom mission of God. They are described as people that are teaching. They are described as people that are healing. They are described as people that are delivering others. Jesus is thrilled about it. And so the next two stories are a continuation of this thought. Luke then shows us two stories that describe for us two unexpected apprentices of Jesus. Do you want to know what kind of people are disciples of Jesus? Do you want to know what kind of people are sitting at his feet and learning under his teaching? Do you want to know what kind of people are going to be the leaders and hold significance within the church? It's these two kinds of people. It's a Samaritan and it's a woman. The story of the Good Samaritan is of a looked-down-upon person living out kingdom values. A Samaritan is the example of someone living out the two greatest commands given by God to the people of Israel. A Samaritan is living and acting like Jesus. The story of the sisters is to show an unexpected person is sitting at the feet of Jesus. A woman is sitting as a student at the feet of a rabbi. She's being framed as an apprentice of Jesus, someone who will eventually do what Jesus is doing. Unexpected disciples bring Jesus so much great joy and delight. We won't spend too much time on the first story, the story of the Good Samaritan, but I'd love to zero in on the words at the end of the story. The word to the scribe, or the religious lawyer, the religious expert, is to go and do like the Samaritan is doing. A Samaritan is intentionally used by Jesus as an example of someone that is embracing and participating in the kingdom mission of God. What, what is Luke doing here? Do you remember earlier the verse that, that was up on the screen? Jesus is rejoicing because it isn't the wise, the clever, and the learned. It isn't the kings and the prophets that are understanding these things. It's the childlike. It's the humble. 
And so, so what Luke is doing is saying, let me give you an example of that, right? The story starts, and I'm reading from the, from the New Living Translations. It says, one day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus. I mean, that is just a flat-out example of the clever and the wise and the learned, right? A, an expert in the religious law stood up to test Jesus. But the story ends with Jesus telling that expert that learned and clever one, now you go and act like this Samaritan. You, the expert in religious law, are to go out and live like the Samaritan in this story. Listen now. Unexpected disciples, unexpected people, are full-on participants in the gospel. And what Jesus is doing here in this story is he's opening an understanding for the church that unlikely people can actually be examples of what it means to be his disciples. These are the kinds of people who are actually going out and loving the Lord with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving their neighbor as themselves. What kinds of people? Samaritans. And this should be a point of absolute joy and delight for us. If unexpected people are living like disciples of Jesus, then we also can be disciples of Jesus. It is a story meant to empower and to encourage and cause rejoicing and celebration within our own hearts. If a Samaritan can do it, <laughs> we can do it. You. You. You, you can be a full-on participant in the kingdom mission of God. You can also go out and do likewise. You also can love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. You can too. Let's go to that next story, but before we do, let me tell you a little story about Larissa and myself. When we were in Bible college, we weren't yet married at the time, we weren't dating at the time, she was just someone I had a crush on. <laughs> but we were taking a theology class together, and it was structured that at the end of the semester, there would be hosted debates. And these hosted debates would be on the different theological issues that we were wrestling with throughout that class. Well, one of the theological issues that we were wrestling was, with was the theology of women as leaders in the church. And so I thought it would be fun to sign up for the negative side of it, or the no. Like, no, women cannot have a, whole, a place of leadership within the church. A, a friend of mine, a quad mate of mine, had also signed up for that. Um, so we got paired up together, and we would be the ones that would be presenting um, the no, they cannot side of the debate. Larissa and one of her friends signed up for yes, they can, <laughs> hold the place of leadership within the community of believers. Well, listen, this debate got heated. <laughs> and at one point, my debate partner, not me, <laughs> well, I'm sorry, Larissa's deb debate partner got up and she wrote a Greek word out. And I think it was from, from the book of um, either, I think it was from Timothy, she writes out this word, and she forgot one of the accent marks on the word. And the professor got up, and he put the accent mark up on the word. And then when my debate partner got up, he said, well, obviously, they can't be leaders in the church. They can't even spell correctly. <laughs> like, it was, it was devastating. Like, it was like, like that cringeworthy kind of moment. Later on, we were told by the professor that he's like, right when he got up and started to do it, he was like, what am I doing here in this moment? <laughs> I 
Larissa and her uh, debate partner left the class. I found out, found this out later on, turning to one another and said about my debate partner, John, and me, those guys are never going to end up married. <laughs> Can I tell you that when Larissa and I were dating, we got an invitation to go to the wedding of our debate partners. <laughs> who ended up marrying one another, and the officiant, officiant of their wedding was our theology professor. <laughs> <laughs> it does show that men maybe can learn. Listen now, I, I tell this story for, for a handful of reasons. The topic of women and their role of leadership in the church has caused a lot of hurt. Just navigating this topic has caused a lot of hurt. And yes, the topic remains a place of debate within the church at large. It isn't just an easy conversation that I'm just going to waltz into. Like, there isn't a lot of weight and experience and baggage and hurt and conflicting views on. But I do want to get into it because here's, here's, here's the thing. Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus is of great significance. This is an extremely unexpected place for, for any woman to be. And to help you understand that, let me, let me read to you something else that Luke writes, and it's in the book of Acts. He's quoting the Apostle Paul. This is what the Apostle Paul says. He says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as you, all of you are this day. Luke uses the same description of Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus as he does when he quotes the Apostle Paul talking about being the student of a rabbi sitting at the feet of Gamaliel. To, to be described as sitting at the feet of a teacher, of a rabbi, is to in, in, invoke an understanding that this person is a full-on student of this rabbi. That, that, let, me, let me read to you again from N.T. Wright. Here's the way that, that he describes it. To sit at someone's feet meant, quite simply, to be their student. And to sit at the feet of a rabbi was what you did if you wanted to be a rabbi yourself. There is no thought here of learning for learning's sake. Mary has, quite, has quietly taken her place as a would-be teacher and preacher of the kingdom of God. This is a paradigm making moment for the church. Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. This is a statement by Luke that unexpected people will be full-on participants in the kingdom mission of God. Unexpected people will be apprentices of Jesus. And it is a statement for all of us to know. There is room for you at the feet of Jesus. There's room for you here. Jesus saying that her sitting at his feet is the good and right thing for her. This is where she should be. Again, it's a monumental moment in the life of the church. It is an invitation for all followers of Jesus. You can be a student of Rabbi Jesus. 
and invoked in that understanding is, is that there is space for you to do the things that Jesus is doing. The teaching, the preaching, the healing, the delivering, like, like everything that you see Jesus doing. He's empowering his church, all of his church, to understand there's space for you. There's space for you. You. Do you get to sit at the feet of Jesus? Come and sit at the feet of Jesus. And there's an absolutely critical point of understanding here in our sitting at the feet of Jesus, and we'll wrap up with this thought. In previous weeks, I mentioned that Luke loves to constantly incorporate food into his stories. And here there's a bit of a food pun that kind of takes place. If you go on to the next slide, this is from the English Standard Version. This is why I wanted to read from this translation. Jesus says, when he's talking to, to, to Martha, Mary's sister, he says, but one, one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. What is Jesus doing here in these words? He's telling Martha, the one who is serving, that she needs to understand that Jesus is actually the one that's serving here in this place. He's distributing a dish. He's giving out portions. He's, he's the sustenance of Mary. You're busy going about serving and doing all these things, but Mary has chosen what is necessary. She has been fed a good portion, a good dish. And this dish will not be taken from her. Jesus is letting us know, I'm the one that is serving. I'm the one that is sustaining you. And so it isn't, yeah, I mean, listen, it isn't saying that, that serving is bad but there is a priority that needs to take place in all of our hearts. It is that we are first and foremost called to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn from him. And all serving flows out of that. So this message isn't just, yeah, go out and love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It isn't just go love your neighbors as yourself. Go and be full participants in the kingdom mission of God through your own strength. That is not the message. The one thing that is necessary for all of us is to understand that first and foremost, we need to be served by Jesus. We, we need to be a people that sit at his feet to be present with him. He, he needs to serve us if we are ever going to go out and serve others. Service flows out of sitting at the feet of Jesus. And so Luke wisely balances the statement to the religious expert of going out and doing with the story of Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. The sitting, the sitting at Jesus' feet. That is what is most necessary. And there is space for all of us to sit at the feet. Of Jesus. Brian, would you come back up and let's let's conclude in, in song together. Jesus, our our hope, our desire is to simply be present with you. To be near. Father, it, is, it has been a, a prayer that, that I know we have, have lifted up you know, quite recently over these, these past few weeks. It's, it's the space of saying, Lord, continue to create within us a hunger, an appetite, 
a desire to spend time with you. Awaken within us a desire to be near you. Lord, earlier this morning, we, we sang that, that your goodness is running after us. And I pray that we would see that in new, fresh ways this morning. For those of us that are needing a word of encouragement, a word of affirmation from your spirit, Jesus, would, be that, would that be part of your goodness that's running after us? For those of us that might be in a space where we feel distant and alone, unsure of your promises and your goodness, Jesus, still, we pray, would your goodness run after us? Father, for those of us that have been longing to see joy once again, joy and hope overtake our hearts, <laughs> would that would that be part of your goodness that's running after us this morning? Jesus, again, like Brian led us earlier this morning, we, we just want to know you. We want to be near you. We want to sit at your feet. And as we do so, would we see beaming face of your joy and delight looking back at us. By, by the empowering of your spirit, would we be able to look up to you and see just how much you delight in us, we pray. We say that in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Church, if you'd stand and let's head back into song together.